ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار So we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise him, we seek his aid and assistance and we beg his forgiveness We seek refuge with Allah from the evils of our own souls and the consequences of our sins Whomever Allah guides aright, none can misguide, and whomever Allah leaves to stray, none can guide aright. I testify that none deserves worship but Allah alone, without partner, and I testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's final messenger and his most devout and sincere worshipper. The best speech is the speech of Allah ta'ala, and the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. And the worst of all things are those that are newly introduced and invented into the religion. Everything newly in- invented into the religion is an innovation, a bid'ah, and every religious innovation is misguidance, <coughs> and misguidance leads to the fire. Uh, so uh, tonight, we're going to continue the topic uh, that we started uh, at quite a while back. There's been a bit of a, a break, but if you remember, the topic that I started was about Islamic knowledge, its importance, its virtues, and how to attain it by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the last uh, circle, we spoke a bit about some of the verses in the Qur'an uh, which speak about the virtues and the importance of knowledge and the superiority and the high rank and status of the scholars, the people who know and have knowledge of Islam. And we looked at a little bit about the importance of knowledge and the uh, necessity, the need that every Muslim has for uh, seeking Islamic knowledge, knowledge about his religion, to, to be educated about the deen of Islam to an adequate uh, degree. We continue this week, uh, and since there, there's uh, so much that can, that can be said about this topic, and since time is short and we have, you know, we continue this topic uh, over a number of weeks, uh, one of the blessings that we have uh, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave His Messenger uh, what He Himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, described as jawami'ul kalim, comprehensive words such that the Prophet ﷺ would speak, uh, f- uh, when he would speak, he would speak concise few words, which were, which were <coughs> uh, few in number, but had a lot of meaning. And this is part of the uh, blessing of the revelation, the wahi that Rasulullah ﷺ was given. And so the ulama explained this jawami al kalim where the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, Uti tu jawami al kalim. I have been given comprehensive words. Words which are few in, in number or which are concise but have so much meaning that you know the ulama for so, for a long time will explain and derive so many benefits and so much wisdom from them. So for this topic of knowledge, we'll continue with a single hadith today, explaining inshallah ta'ala and pondering over a single hadith about this very important topic. And then continue with other uh, uh, issues related to knowledge, uh, if and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits in the future. And this hadith <coughs> is, a, is a famous hadith reported by a, the companion Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Allah be pleased with him. A famous companion, Sahabi, who was known for his uh, knowledge and his um, uh, his righteousness and his uh, zuhd, his leaving of the worldly allurements and his 
turning to the ibadah, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, as we said, he was one, one of the scholars amongst the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So Abu Darda radiallahu anhu reports a hadith and there's a story or an incident that occurred behind the reporting of this hadith. So we'll look at the whole text. And the hadith is reported in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad and uh, in other collections in the Sunan of Abu Dawood in At-Tirmidhi and some of the phrases or some parts of the hadith are also in Sahih Muslim as we'll come on to see. But this hadith in its entirety is in those collections of hadith. And uh, it, 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 he reported it and he narrated it when a person once came to him. Abu Darda was in Damascus. He had moved and he lived in Damascus. And a person, a man came to him from Medina. And he said to him, uh, I've come to you uh, because of a hadith. Uh, <coughs> That I've heard that you report from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this man travelled from Medina to Damascus to hear a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He 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 knew he heard that this companion, this Sahabi Abu Darda, reports a hadith from Rasulullah alaihi salatu wasallam. So Abu Darda asked him, asked him, uh, he 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 asked him, what what has brought you to me? Ma akdamak ya akhi? What has brought you to me? So the man replied, he said, Hadithun <coughs> Balagani Annaka to Hadithu Bihi and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The thing that brought me to you is a hadith, a, a, a narration that I, I've heard, it's reached me that you narrate from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam. So Abu Darda said to him, Ama jit ali haja? Didn't you come for any other need? Do you have some other purpose that you've traveled all this way? Uh, the man replied, no. So Abu Darda said, Ama jita li tijara? Did you not travel all this way for some business, some trade? Uh, the man replied, La. No. And so Abu Darda confirmed, Ma jita illa fi talabi hadha al hadith? You didn't come except to seek this hadith, this single narration? And the man replied, yes, that's my purpose for coming. So he said, radiallahu anhu, he said, فَإِنِّي سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَقُولُ مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَلَكَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَوْ سَلَكَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَ لَتَضَعُ أَجْنِحَتَهَا رِضًا لِطَالِبَ الْإِلْم وَإِنَّ الْعَالِمَ لَا يَسْتَغْفِرُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ حَتَّى الْحِيْتَانِ فِي الْبَحْرِ وَفَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِ الْقَمَرِ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدَرِ عَلَى سَائِرِ الْكَوَاكِبِ وَإِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءَ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَإِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ لَمْ يُوَرِّثُوا دِينَارًا وَلَا دِرْهَمًا وَإِنَّمَا وَرَثُوا الْعِلْمَ فَمَنْ أَخَذَ بِهِ أَخَذَ بِحَذٍ وَافِرٍ So Abu Darda said, after confirming that this man had only come to hear this hadith, or hear a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. He said, in that case, I heard Allah's Messenger ﷺ say, whoever treads a path seeking knowledge, Allah will put him on a path to paradise, to Jannah. Whoever treads a path seeking knowledge, Allah will put him on a path to Jannah, to paradise. وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَتَضَعُ أَجْنِحَتَهَا رِضًا لِطَالِبَ الْإِلْمِ And verily the malaika, the angels, lay down their wings, being pleased, for the Talib al the seeker of knowledge. They put their wings down for him to walk over. وَإِنَّ الْعَالِمْ يَسْتَغْفِرَ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ حَتَّى الْحِيْتَانِ فِي الْبَحْرِ And the scholar, the person who knows, who has knowledge of Islam, 
everything <coughs> in the heavens and in the earth seeks forgiveness for him asks Allah to forgive him even the fish in the sea even the fish in the sea they make istighfar for the alim <coughs> And then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَفَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِ الْقَمَرِ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدَرِ عَلَى سَائِرِ الْكَوَاكِبِ And the superiority of a scholar over an abid, someone who's a devout worshipper, but he's not a scholar, someone who worships Allah devoutly, he's a righteous person. The, the superiority of the scholar, the alim, over the abid, the one who worships Allah uh, devoutly, is like the superiority or the excellence of the full moon over the rest of the stars or planets in the sky. So that's the comparison. Uh, وَإِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءَ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ And indeed the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. <laughs> وَإِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ لَمْ يُوَرِّثُوا دِينَارًا وَلَا دِرْهَمًا And the prophets did not leave anything, uh, any money, any worldly wealth, money, dinar or dirham as inheritance. وَإِنَّمَا وَرَّثُوا الْعِلْمِ They only left knowledge as their inheritance. فَمَنْ أَخَذَ بِهِ أَخَذَ بِحَدٍ وافر. Whoever the, then takes this knowledge from them, has taken a great fortune. Has taken a great fortune. So this is a a, a beautiful and uh, uh, hadith from Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. And there are many things about this topic of ours, the topic of knowledge in Islam, that we can glean, that we can learn from this hadith, based upon what the scholars have said uh, and have written. In fact, uh, part of this class, uh, this lesson, and so much more that I, we can't cover in the time that we have is actually from a book by the famous scholar Ibn Rajab al hanbali rahimahullah, who actually wrote a treatise, a, a book, in explanation of this single hadith. And it's a, a very beautiful explanation, which we hope we can try to share uh, tonight and in the, in, in, in the time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits. So the first thing that we... Um, we can glean or we can be reminded about from this narration is this great act and this virtue of traveling and expending efforts uh, in order to seek knowledge. We see an example of this when a man traveled from Medina to Damascus to hear a single hadith from a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is not an isolated incident. This was something which is known in the books if, uh, of history and in the, in the biographies of the virtuous scholars uh, of the past, from the companions themselves down through the generations, that they would expend a lot of effort and a lot of time, and they would travel in order to seek knowledge, especially to hear the hadith, the statements of Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. Because of course, <coughs> after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the Qur'an, the most valuable speech and the most uh, precious words that we can have, uh, that we can obtain on the face of this earth, is the statements of Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. Because this is from the wahi, this is from the revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. <coughs> As the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, إِنِّي أُوتِيتُ الْقُرْآنِ وَمِثْلُهُ مَعْهُ I have been given the Qur'an and the like of it with it. So <clears throat> the message of Islam and the wahi, the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in, the, in His own words in the Qur'an which are the best of words and they are His own words subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after that, along with <clears throat> the revelation of the Qur'an came the revelation of the sunnah. And this is what the ulama used to uh, explain from the famous uh, tabi'een, students of the companions. Some of them would say that Jibreel used to come to the Prophet ﷺ with the sunnah in the same way that he would come with the Qur'an. 
This is from the, the revelation, the wahi. So, of course, the Sahaba, the companions, and those who of the early Muslims who are known as the our pious predecessors, the Salaf al-Salih, they used to have a great uh, keenness and interest <coughs> that <coughs> wherever they could find a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, they would they would seek it out. And uh, so <clears throat> there are many examples. Ibn Rajab mentioned some examples of some of the companions themselves who would do this. And in fact, the, the examples are so many. And this was one of the ways in which the sunnah has reached us. If you can imagine, you know, we sit in, in our day and age and for a number of centuries we have books of hadith, books of knowledge. We can easily pick up a copy of Sahih al-Bukhari and we can read hundreds and thousands of ahadith. Have you ever thought how these ahadith reached us? How did they get to us? They got to us through the, 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 the hard efforts, the, the great efforts of those early Muslims, the companions, the Sahaba, and those who followed them, who preserved those ahadith and passed them on, and who traveled to such an extent that there's, there's a book, uh, entitled Ar-Rihla fi Talab al-Hadith by the famous scholar Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi rahimahullah he has a uh, he has a book called Ar-Rihla fi Talab al-Hadith traveling to seek hadith to in search of hadith and he explains within it many examples of how the early muslims used to travel to hear a single hadith from the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and what what they used to go through and what were their manners and what were their ways of doing that all of which goes to show us the value that we have. And it's for us, it's easy. And this should actually shame us. Or it should make us feel ashamed. It should make us feel ashamed that often, often when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a lot of knowledge easy for us in this day and age, we find often, if we just reflect upon ourselves, that we can hardly find the time to read the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We hardly find the time to open a book, to buy, go and buy a book. To, and even now, you, all you have to do is press a button on a, on a computer and you can have thousands of ahadith in front of you. And these came to us and by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made these men the Sahaba and those who followed them. He made them to be the, the ones who carried this knowledge and passed it down to us. And so for us it's easy. But often we can't even, you know, we can't even be bothered, we can't even find the time to to be interested in knowledge. Even though it's easy for us. You, in, from the comfort of your own home you can, you can be reminded of a lot of knowledge. So Ibn Rajah mentioned some examples of how the Sahaba traveled to hear the Ahadith. Um, and he said, وَقَدْ رَحْ إِلَىٰ أَبُوْ أَيُوبَ الْأَنصَارِ مِنَ الْمَدِينَةِ إِلَىٰ مَصَرِ لِلِقَاءِ رَجُلْ مِنَ الصَّحَابَ بَلَغَهُ عَنْهُ حَدِيثٌ يُحَدِّثُهُ عَنِ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. So he gave the example of the famous companion Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, who's a Sahabi. He himself is a companion. رضي الله عنه. Who heard from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself? He travelled from Medina to Egypt to to a man, another companion from the Sahaba, because he heard that he had a hadith which he narrated from the Prophet. وَكَذَلِكَ فَعَلَ جَابِرْ إِبْنُ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ الْأَنْصَارِ مَا أَكَثَرَتِ مَا سَمِعَ مِنَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مِنَ الْحَدِيثِ وَرَوَى the other, the other famous companion, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, also did the same, traveled from one country to another to hear a single hadith, despite the fact that he himself narrated so many ahadith from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. As we know, Jabir ibn Abdullah is one of those companions who narrate many hadith in the books of hadith, Bukhari, Muslim and other collections. Many ahadith are, rep are reported from Jabir ibn Abdullah. But he himself, he heard that there's another companion in another country who narrates a hadith which he didn't know from the Prophet. So he traveled to hear that hadith. So 
Ibn Rajab summarizes, he says, وَكَانَ أَحْدُهُمْ يَرْحَلُ إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ دُونَهُ فِي الْفَضْلِ وَالْعِلْمِ لِطَلَبِ شَيْءٍ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ لَا يَجِدُهُ عِنْدُهُ So, to summarize, from those pious people of the past, the companions and those who, were, uh, who followed them, they would travel to seek knowledge, to, to seek a person who was less than them in knowledge and less, less virtuous or less senior than them. They would see, go and seek knowledge with him because that, that person had knowledge which they didn't have. Okay. And the, one of the best examples that we can have and sufficient, as Ibn Rajab says, sufficient as an example of in traveling and making efforts to seek knowledge wherever you can is the story of Musa alayhi salam in the Quran. Musa alayhi salam is one of the uh, most senior of the Anbiya, the prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is the Kaleem of Allah. He is the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to directly. And Everyone knows the high status, the high rank that Musa alayhi salam, the Prophet Musa had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet when he heard, when he was informed that there is a man who has some knowledge that he didn't have, Khadir, he traveled to him as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in Surah Al-Kahf. Read Surah Al-Kahf and the story of Musa, how Musa went with his boy, and he traveled and he said, I'm not going to give up huh, until I, you know, find this man or, or, I, or I stay for years, ages in search of this person. So they went in search of Khadir, who was another righteous servant from the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And according to many ulama, he was one of the prophets. He was a Nabi. And he had some knowledge because he was not in the region of Musa alayhi salam. He had some knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which Musa didn't have. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he informed that there is a man who has knowledge that you don't have, Musa traveled to him and we know the story in Surah Al-Kahf. And he said to him when he reached him, finally when he reached him, he said, can I follow you so that you can teach me what some of what Allah has given you of knowledge. So this is one of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala traveling in search of knowledge himself, let alone anyone else. And if there was anyone who could feel or who might have felt that they don't need to travel, it would be the man who receives wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But since, no, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us in such a way that there may be those who are more knowledgeable than us. There may be those who have something that we don't have of knowledge. Even the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa that there, there is some knowledge, more knowledge that you can have, Musa went and sought it. And this is enough of an example, uh, as an example for the importance of seeking knowledge and traveling and making efforts to seek knowledge. So, there, you know, there are many examples. We have the statement, another very poignant statement of one of the most knowledgeable of the companions of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Ibn Mas'ud, as we know, is one of the companions who were experts in the Qur'an. And... He was one of those whom we have been told to take the Qur'an from. And he was one of the fuqaha, jurists, legal experts and scholars amongst the Sahaba. One of the people of fatwa amongst the Sahaba was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And the Prophet ﷺ advised us to take from Ibn Mas'ud, to listen to the advice of Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud anhum, himself, he said, speaking about his own... Uh, efforts and his own dedication to the Quran. He said, Radiallahu anhu, 
والله الذي لا إله إلا هو ما أنزلت سورة من كتاب الله إلا وأنا أعلم أين نزلت ولا نزلت آية من كتاب الله إلا وأنا أعلم فيما أنزلت ولو أعلم أحدا أعلم مني بكتاب الله تبلغه الإبل لركبت إليه Ibn Mas'ud said, there is not a surah, there is not a chapter in the Qur'an except I know where it was revealed. And there is not an ayah, there is not an ayah, there is not a verse from the book of Allah except I know in what context or for what it was revealed. And by Allah, if I know, if I know of a person who, ha- who, uh, uh, who has some knowledge, more knowledge than me about the book of Allah and I, and I know where he is and he can be traveled to I can get on a camel and I can travel to him I will travel to him so this is the uh, concern and the importance that they would give so Ibn Mas'ud even though uh, and we learn from this a, a couple of things we're reminded that a person and this is really the a quality of a righteous scholar We'll come on to discuss this a bit later. The more a person knows, the more he's interested, if he's sincere, the more he'll be interested to increase his knowledge. He never thinks he knows enough and he never thinks he has enough. He doesn't become proud with his knowledge and he doesn't become arrogant and he doesn't think that nobody else can teach him. Here's Ibn Mas'ud who knew the occasion of revelation of every ayah in the book of Allah telling us that if I hear, if I know that there's a man who has something about the book of Allah. He has something about the Quran more than me and it's possible for me to travel to him, get on a camel and, and ride to him, I will go to him. So that's the that's the um, importance or that gives you an idea of the the uh, size of the, the issue and the, and the importance of the issue. And then, um, you know, there are uh, there are many examples Ibn Rajab mentions for example وَخَرَجَ مَسْرُوكٌ مِّنَ الْكُوفَ إِلَى الْبَصْرَةِ لِرَجُلٍ يَسْأَلُهُ أَنْ آيَةٍ مِّنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَلَمْ يَجِدْ إِنْدَهُ فِيهَا إِلْمًا فَأُخْبِرَ أَنْ رَجُلٍ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الشَّامِ فَرَجِعَ إِلَى الْكُوفَ ثُمَّ خَرَجَ إِلَى الشَّامِ إِلَى ذَلِكَ الرَّجُلْ فِي طَلَبِهَا So this is Masruq. Masruq was from the Tabi'een, those who came uh, as students of the companions. The people who came in the generation after the companions. Masruq is a famous tabi'i, famous scholar in Quran and in narrating hadith. So Ibn Raja mentions Masruq, rahimahullah, traveled from Kufa to Basra uh, to a man to ask him about one ayah of the Quran, to ask him about one verse of the book of Allah. And he didn't find him. He didn't find that knowledge with that man. So he was told that there's another person in Sham, Transjordan, that uh, with that knowledge. So he went back to Kufa and then traveled to Sham to get that knowledge about that one single verse of the Quran. That's the efforts that they used to put in uh, in order to seek knowledge. ورحل رجل من الكوفة إلى الشام إلى أبي الدرداء يستفتيه في يمين حلفها. And a man traveled from Kufa to Sham, Syria and that area, to Abu Darda, to the same Sahabi, the same companion Abu Darda, to seek a fatwa about an, an oath that he had taken. To seek a fatwa about a, a, an oath that he had taken. ورحل سعيد بن جبير من الكوفة إلى بن أباس بمكة يسأله عن تفسير آية. And the famous Tabi'i Sa'id ibn Jubair, another great scholar from the second generation. Sa'id ibn Jubair traveled from Kufa to Ibn Abbas in Mecca, the famous companion Ibn Abbas, to ask him about the tafsir of one ayah. The explanation of one ayah. 
ورحل الحسن إلى الكوفة إلى كعب بن عجرة يسأله عن قصته في فدية الأداء and again another legal issue seeking a fatwa Al Hassan, the famous Tabi Al Hassan Al Basri, rahimahullah, traveled from Kufa to Kaab ibn Ujra, another famous scholar, in order to ask him about the issue of fidya, of expiation, how to pay a compensation for an issue. So, anyway, the examples of this are many, as, and as I said, there's a whole uh, work uh, which records these kind of incidents and these kind of travels. And then the, the point from this that Ibn Rajab makes, he says, وَفِي هَذَا إِشَارَةً إِلَىٰ أَنَّ مَنْ أَهَمَّهُ أَمْرُ دِينِهِ كَمَا أَهَمُّهُ أَمْرُ الدُّنْيَا إِذَا حَدَثَتْ لَهُ حَادِثَ فِي دِينِهِ لَا يَجِدُ مَنْ يَسْأَلْهُ أَنَّا إِلَّا فِي بَلَدٍ بَعِيدٍ فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَتَأَخَّرْ أَنِ السَّفَرْ إِلَيْهِ لِيَسْتَبْرِئَ لِدِينِهِ كما أنه لو عرض له هناك كسب دنيوي لبادر السفر إليه. So in all of this, these actions and these deeds, there is an indication for us, a reminder, that a person who is concerned about his religion, if he has a real concern about the the healthiness and the 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 the, the soundness of his deen, that if he needs to know something. If he needs, uh, if something occurs to him and he needs to find out what is the Islamic ruling, what is the real, uh, what should he do in this situation, then that person, if he doesn't find anyone from the scholars in his country, from the people of Fatwa, if he doesn't find anyone knowledgeable enough in his locality, then he should hurry to go and travel to another place to find a person. Just in the same way as if a person found out that he had <clears throat> a source of income, a new business opportunity arose from him in another country, how quickly he would go. How quickly he would move from one land to another to follow some money or some new opportunity or some new way of seeking an income. In that same way, a person, a Muslim who's concerned for his religion should make those efforts should make the effort. If you if you can't find, or if you're in a position that you can't find knowledge in your vicinity, in your locality, then you should be prepared to go and make the effort and, you know. And that's why there's a saying of the ulama, the scholars, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an attitude that we should take. They say that knowledge shouldn't come to you. You should go to knowledge. Yeah, you should go to knowledge. And in this there's a great blessing. Because as we'll see, when you actually make an effort to seek knowledge, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you. As Allah subhanahu as the Prophet والسلام, said in this hadith, Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilman, salaka Allahu lahu bihi tariqan il jannah. Whoever treads a path, whoever makes that effort and seeks a path or, or traverses or follows a path to seek knowledge, then Allah puts him on a path to Jannah. So don't wait for knowledge to come to you. If you have knowledge, knowledge somewhere, someone has knowledge, go and seek it. Go and find it. That in itself is a blessing and that in itself brings about a lot of good. In this hadith, the, the hadith we're talking about today, the hadith of Abu Darda, we find that he gave glad tidings. He gave good, good news and he was happy with the arrival of this man, when he found out that this man had come to seek hadith, to seek knowledge, to find out what the Prophet ﷺ said, he gave him the glad tidings by responding and narrating this hadith first. This wasn't the hadith that the man came to ask about. This was the uh, uh, good news that Abu Darda gave to him. And that's why he asked him, have you come for some other need? Have you got some business, some trade that you're doing? Have, have you only come to me? From this place, from Medina to Damascus, have you only come to hear this hadith from me? So when the man confirmed that this was the case, he gave him the glad tidings. He said, I heard Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say this. And this is shows us that it, it's, it's, it's a, a great thing for a man to seek knowledge and to travel and to 
put efforts and that, and that person is to be congratulated and given good tidings and this was the habit of the uh, the the companions the sahaba that when uh, someone would come to them and they knew that that person was seeking knowledge they would give him glad tidings because this was the wasiyah this was actually an instruction from the prophet himself alayhi salatu wasalam as is mentioned in some ahadith that he advised his companions to give glad tidings to the talibul ilm to the seeker of knowledge when the seeker of knowledge comes the student of knowledge comes you should give them glad tidings and 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 welcome them because this is a great ibadah it's a great worship that they're doing and in it, in of itself the seeking of knowledge is a, is a worship and to this day we find the scholars uh in, in every land in every place when they find that someone is enthusiastic to seek knowledge and to come and ask and seek knowledge we always find them welcoming those students and and uh and and making them uh, comfortable and making them happy and we've experienced this and those of you who have visited uh, our scholars and have traveled and have seen the people of fatwa here in this country and in any other place you will notice how welcoming they are to a person who travels and this is the this is this is uh, an implementation of this sunnah it's a sunnah from the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and a sunnah of the companions that they would welcome and give good news to the person when they saw that person making an effort <clears throat> And this is something which is indicated in the Quran itself. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, addressing his, his Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمُ When those come to you, O Muhammad, when, they, when those who believe come to you, then say, سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Give them the greetings of peace peace and say that Allah has written upon himself a rahma mercy so this was the command that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to his messenger that when the believers come to him then he should give them these salams and he should uh, tell them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful so this was the practice they used to put this into practice the ulama the sahaba the ulama after them that anyone who came to them seeking knowledge then he would give them glad tidings and this happened once, the, again, the famous uh, scholar Al-Hasan al-Basri, al-Tabi'i. Once uh, many people, you know, they crowded around him, ha- around his house, seeking to listen to him and seeking to get some knowledge from him. And so they made, you know, noise and there was a crowd. And so one of his uh, family, um, his son, you know, sort of tried to tell them off. <laughs> he tried to kind of tell them off for making, you know, for coming and crowding around the house. So Al Hassan said, No, 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 stop. And he recited this ayah, this same ayah, that when those who believe come to you, say, say Salamun alaykum, and say that Allah has written upon Himself mercy. This is how they used to be happy that people would seek knowledge, even if it was, you know, made uh, an inconvenience or it made, you know, they had patience to, to accommodate this. So, if we then look at some of the contents of this hadith, or before we do that, we, we, we find that for this reason and for this fact that there's a lot of rahmah, there's a lot of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a lot of reward um, for seeking knowledge and for making those efforts, we find that this was one of the things that our forefathers, the pious predecessors, they would, um, they would lament or they would miss uh, when it came uh, f- to that time when they couldn't seek knowledge anymore and they couldn't sit and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek knowledge with their fellow believers anymore. Ibn Rajab says, وَلِهَذَا تَأَسَّفَ مُعَاذِ بن جبل عند موته وبكى على مفارقة مجالس الذكر فقال إنما أبكي على ضمأ الهواجر وقيام وقيام ليل في الشتاء 
ومزاحمة العلماء بالركب عند حلك الذكر So when he was dying the famous again very knowledgeable companion Mu'adh ibn Jabal رضي الله عنه when he was dying on his deathbed he cried and he said what makes me cry are three things these three things have made make me cry ذم الهواجر Thir- being thirsty when when you when you're fasting in the hot days he would remember the the pleasure of fasting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the feeling that you have when you're thirsty and you're just waiting to finish your fast for Allah this made him cry when he was dying wa qiyam layl and the standing in night in prayer in the winter when it's cold wa muzahamat al ulama and crowding around the ulama the scholars fi majalis aw bil rukab inda hilak al dhikr crowding around the ulama uh, when in their sittings uh, in the in the in the gatherings of knowledge the ga- gatherings of remembrance of dhikr they used to call the gatherings of knowledge hilak al dhikr the circles of dhikr and this is it's an important point we need to remember so we don't get confused and we don't get an understanding which is a, 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 a misguided understanding if you look at those early muslims uh, and even in some of the ahadith this term is used circles of dhikr the hilaq al dhikr the circles of dhikr if you look at this statement of muad ibn jabal and others we understand what the hilaq al dhikr means because we got we have uh, we have people today who Ha, who practice this bid'ah you know of what they call dhikr and they sit in a circle and they make dhikr they say what, they, what, what you know these uh, the sufi and these kind of people and they do all kinds of innovative practices allahu 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 sitting in a circle and they call this the circ- this is a dhikr circle the dhikr circle was what muad ibn jabal said huh muzahamat al ulama crowding around the scholars those are the th- those are the circles of dhikr where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is remembered. The, the, the studying of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the studying of the sunnah. So these circles of dhikr don't mean this innovation, this bid'ah that is practiced by these Sufis and other kinds of these heretics who have misunderstood and misinterpreted the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he, Mu'adh felt this uh, uh, lament or this uh, sadness not because they were going to miss something of this dunya you know this world that they were going to miss the family and oh i'm you know i'm i'm going i'm going to miss my wife and my children i'm dying and no the thing that they would remember and the thing that they would feel that they would miss or that they would uh, you know uh, at the point of death of course if a person is admitted to jannah yeah if a person is admitted to jannah to paradise he's not going to miss anything Except one thing actually, there's an authentic hadith which, me- which mentions that the only thing the people of Jannah will ever miss is a, a period of time where they didn't remember Allah in the dunya. But, so at the point of death, what is the thing of this world that you're going to miss and what is it that you're going to cry over and what is it that you... These people used to cry over the feeling of fasting in, in, in the summer. I and mean, we all know as Muslims, walillahi alhamd, how good or how much we look forward to Ramadan and to fasting. Yeah, even though sometimes it's hot and we feel, you know, hungry and we feel thirsty. Don't we always look forward to Ramadan? We always feel fond. And this time, even this, even the smell that comes from our, our mouths and even that time of thirst and hunger, you know, and that rumbling of the stomach, even that feels good. But this is from Iman. This is from Iman. Because the good deeds, they make a, a believer feel good. And he, and he enjoys them. And so we have this concept of enjoying ibadah. That the Salaf, the early Muslims used to enjoy worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And enjoy even the efforts. They used to find a pleasure from ibadah that you don't find from doing other things. So this is the kind of things that they would miss. Because of this virtue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rahmah, his mercy is for those who seek knowledge and who make the efforts and they travel, then this would make them cry when they were dying. That They would miss going to classes and they would miss going to 
see the ulama. So in this hadith, if we now, after this introduction, begin the explanation of this hadith, or begin what we can in the time that we have left, the first, we'll take it phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. The first part of this hadith is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَلَكَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whoever treads a path in order to seek knowledge, Allah will put him on a path to Al-Jannah, to Paradise. And in one narration, one riwayah of this hadith, سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Allah will make easy for him or facilitate for him a path to Paradise. So this statement alone is enough to make us understand how important it is to make efforts and to and to and to uh, follow the means and to take the means in order to attain knowledge of Islam, because we learn from this that knowledge, seeking knowledge, is a way to Jannah, is a path to paradise, and this is the the goal of every person. This is the goal of every Muslim: is that he wants to be admitted into the Jannah of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He wants to be admitted into the paradise of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And to gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. So we learn from this that the closest, as Ibn Rajab says, the closest and easiest way to Jannah is through seeking knowledge. This is the closest way to Jannah. And conversely, trying to worship Allah or trying to get to Jannah through ignorance, without knowledge, has two great problems. Uh, Ibn Rajab mentions one is that it is very difficult it causes so much problems a person who tries to worship Allah with ignorance upon jahl without knowing what, what he should do brings to him so many problems and mashakka difficulties where he does things wrong he causes harm he makes uh, he, he does injustice to others he does injustice to himself he, he, he puts hardship upon himself yes right and secondly, it doesn't lead you to Jannah anyway. It doesn't lead you to Jannah anyway. So those are two big problems of trying to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trying to seek Jannah without knowledge. First, you bring problems upon yourself because of your ignorance. And secondly, it doesn't lead you to Jannah. Jahl, ignorance, doesn't lead a person to paradise. So the closest and easiest way to paradise is through knowledge. And this is also, this part of the hadith is also mentioned in Sahih Muslim, in the hadith uh, reported by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whoever treads a path in order to seek knowledge, Allah will make easy, will facilitate for him a path to paradise. Now what does it mean to tread a path in search of knowledge? So there are two possible meanings, both of which are valid, both of which are correct. The first is treading or traveling a physical path. Walking to the masjid to listen to a lesson of knowledge. Yeah, Actually physically on a physical path, following that path to seek knowledge. The second meaning, as Ibn Raja points out, is following all the different avenues and the means, the wasail, to seek knowledge or to gain knowledge. Like attending classes, reading books. Yeah? In our day and age, listening to the, uh, the classes of scholars. Yeah? A- any any uh, method or any uh, means that you take to seek knowledge is, a par- is, is, is in fact treading a path, even if you don't walk. Meaning, what's the difference between the two? Meaning, that the first is when you actually physically travel or move from one place to another, you seek a, uh, uh, take a path. That's one example of taking a path, of uh, the path of knowledge. The other one is where you just, you do something which brings, you know, knowledge to you. Like, as I said, a person could be sitting in his house, but if he's reading a book of uh, religious knowledge from uh, the scholars, he's reading the Qur'an, 
he, he tries to understand the Quran through reading a tafsir, an explanation of the Quran by you know, reliable scholars. He looks and reads the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He reads books of fiqh and fatwa which explain to him what, how he should worship Allah, how he should uh, behave. Then this, even if he's sitting in his home, is one of the ways, a path to seeking knowledge. Okay? So both of these meanings are included in the hadith. And as we said, the meaning or th- this uh, idea in which the Prophet ﷺ said in this section or this part of the hadith that Allah will make easy for him a path to paradise. Allah will facilitate, will facilitate for him a path to paradise. Again, what does it mean and what does this mean? How How is the path to paradise, how is the way to Jannah made easier and facilitated for a person who seeks knowledge? Well, one uh, there are a number of ways. One of them, Ibn Rajab mentions, is أَنْ يُسَهِّلَ اللَّهُ لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ الْعِلْمِ الَّذِي طَلَبَهُ وَسَلَكَ طَرِيقَهُ وَيَسَّرَهُ عَلَيْهِ فَإِنَّ الْعِلْمِ طَرِيقٌ مُوصِلٌ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ So that's the first way. The first thing is that Allah will make easy that knowledge that you're seeking for you. Because knowledge itself is the path to Jannah. Right? So that's one of the interpretations or one of the meanings when the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah will make easy for him a path to paradise means that Allah will make it easy for you to seek that actual knowledge that you're seeking. He'll make it, he'll facilitate you. If you put the effort in, you you will get the the help and blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to achieve that knowledge. Because achieving knowledge itself, that knowledge itself is a path to paradise. As we said, knowledge is the path to paradise. Because knowledge corrects your actions, it corrects your beliefs. If you have knowledge you and you accept this knowledge and you practice this knowledge, then it corrects your actions, it corrects your beliefs. You say what is right, you do what is right by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you worship Allah correctly. And this is why the knowledge is a path to paradise. So that's the first way in which Jannah, paradise, is facilitated or is made easier for a person who seeks knowledge because he has the knowledge itself. And this is something witnessed to or something which is supported in the Quran, this meaning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكَ We have made the Qur'an easy for uh, remembrance. So is there anyone who will take heed and take the chance and, and take this opportunity? Some of the early Muslim scholars, the Salaf, they explained this ayah and they said, it means هَلْ مِنْ طَالِبِ الْعِلْمٍ فَيُعَانُوا عَلَيْهِ They said this ayah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we made the Qur'an easy for remembrance, so is there anyone or is there one who will take heed? They said, the meaning of this ayah is, is there a student of knowledge? Is there any student of knowledge who now can be helped, can be aided in this seeking of knowledge? So they equated the talabul ilm, this knowledge, seeking knowledge. And that when a person decides that he wants to be a talibul ilm, he wants to be a student of Islam, he wants to be a student of Islamic knowledge, then he will be helped, he will be aided in this area. So that is one of the ways. Another way in which paradise is facilitated for a person who seeks a path uh, or tra- treads a path of knowledge is أن ييسر الله لطالب العلم العمل بمقتضى ذلك العلم إذا قصد بعلمه وجه الله فجعله الله سببا لهدايته والانتفاع به والعمل به وذلك من طرق الجنة الموصلة إليها One of the ways in which Jannah is facilitated is that Allah makes easy for him or facilitates for him to pra- to practice the knowledge that he has gained to put it into practice to act by it because knowledge is is not useful if we don't act according to it 
So for the person who seeks the wajh of Allah, who seeks the face of Allah, who is sincere, when he seeks the knowledge, then Allah facilitates for him and enables him to act by this knowledge, to put it into practice and to worship Allah and to say and to do and to believe all the things that this knowledge necessitates. And this is one of the ways that sends a person to paradise. And this is something indicated uh, uh, in the in the Quran and in the Hadith, in those texts that we read about acting according to our knowledge and putting it to practice, and also in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we have reference to the ben- uh, beneficial knowledge. We have this reference. We mentioned this previously, and we'll visit this topic again. Now the whole point behind knowledge is not academic. It's not something that should be just academic and theoretical. Knowledge in Islam is not like this. We don't study Islam and Islamic knowledge just for academic purposes and just as a kind of, you know, something which is theoretical. Knowledge in Islam is so that we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly and that we can believe and we can say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is correct. And that we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have our deeds, our actions accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam taught us this. He gave us the principle of trying to seek beneficial knowledge and asking Allah for beneficial knowledge. And he told us, he commanded us to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for al-ilm and nafi beneficial knowledge. So this is one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps a person to Jannah is by enabling him to act according to his knowledge that he has gained. And this is a major topic that we will deal with later, uh, ta'ala, and that is the importance of putting into practice what you know. The importance of putting into practice what you know. And to maybe to, you know, uh, towards the end of the time that we have tonight, the last way that is mentioned here is that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables or gives him a way to learn more knowledge and be better guided through the knowledge that he has sought. Yeah? That if a person puts the efforts in sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tries to educate himself about Islam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides him more. He increases him more and gives him more knowledge than the knowledge that he uh, was looking for. Okay? And this is again something which is uh, told to us in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَيَزِيدُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْا هُدَى Allah increases those who seek guidance with more guidance. He increases them in guidance. So just <laughs> trying to be guided, trying, making the effort to know the truth and to follow the truth, seeking that path of knowledge, itself is is a cause for that uh, through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes uh, increases a person's guidance and makes him even more guided okay so this is one of the great benefits also of treading that path uh, you know so uh, again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a, sim, a similar meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ زَادَهُمْ هُدَى وَآتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ Those who uh, seek guidance, who try to be guided. Allah increases them in guidance and gives them their taqwa, gives them their righteousness. He provides them, He bestows upon them their taqwa. This taqwa that we, that, that we, that we uh, strive for, that we want, the taqwa which means consciousness and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fulfilling our obligations, staying away from what is prohibited, from what is haram. This taqwa is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows. So those who seek guidance, those who try to be guided, Allah inc- he, gives, he increases their guidance and He gives them their taqwa. He gives them their taqwa. So these are some of the meanings of this portion of the hadith. This sentence 
in which the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam said whoever seeks uh, whoever treads a path in search of knowledge Allah will make easy for him or facilitate for him a path to Jannah to summarize we were reminded from this portion of the hadith that we've taken so far of the importance of making efforts and traveling and striving in search of Islamic knowledge that Islamic knowledge is the is the easiest the best easiest and uh, you know the most uh, correct way to try to get to paradise to Jannah bi'ithnillahi ta'ala it's the closest and easiest way and it's closest and easiest because it, through this through these efforts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases a person in guidance and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, facilitates for that person the very knowledge which itself leads a person to paradise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that person enables that person blesses that person to get additional guidance and knowledge and taqwa through these means and we remind we were reminded that a person should always value the chance the opportunity to seek more knowledge and to have more knowledge and to meet people the people of ilm the people of knowledge who are more knowledgeable than us and who have the knowledge that we need uh, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly so we should be keen and um, very interested and very concerned to seek out those people and to make efforts to ask them and to uh, listen to them and to learn from them and this was the way of the earliest Muslims no matter how knowledgeable they were no matter how uh, expert they were even the Sahaba even the companions of the Prophet والسلام, would travel and would uh, make you know so much effort just to hear to know of one verse of the, the Quran and to know its meaning or to know one hadith of the Prophet so we should try to you know follow that example and we are much more in need of these efforts than they were uh, we'll uh, close uh, tonight with that part and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, you know enables us to continue we'll continue at some other time بإذن الله تعالى with the hadith أقول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والله تعالى أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين The questions are for Abu Yahya, <laughs> not yeah, I've got for me. Yeah, questions. Um, Still on. Okay. So I can look out for your talk and okay. um, okay. a lot of benefits there. There was one there when, when you mentioned about Ibn Rajab talking about um, treading the path. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it mentioned he mentioned about following all the means to seek knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So does that mean like you know um, any any anybody can be a student of knowledge or you know? Who is a student of knowledge, or can anyone be a student of knowledge? Right. So, um, the w one of the things that we mentioned uh, previously, and that we sh we'll, we'll visit again, inshallah, is that seeking knowledge is something that um, ha is of different degrees. That there is a type of seeking knowledge which is wajib, obligatory upon every Muslim, and in that sense, every Muslim has to be a talibul ilm to that extent. Right, and then there is the details of the Sharia, the details of the laws of Islam, and the details of the explanation of the Quran, the details, the scholarly uh, preservation of the religion, uh, beyond what we need to practice our religion. Seeking that type of knowledge, meaning in the in the way of becoming a scholar then this is something which is one of the greatest acts of worship and it is one of the greatest types of uh, uh, recommended deeds or pursuits that a person can follow so 
uh, every Muslim has to seek a certain amount of knowledge and we'll come on to clarify but basically that means that what you need to practice your religion to stay to, to stay upon the Tawheed of Allah and to stay away from shirk to stay obedient to Allah and to stay away from the haram to remain uh, to make the ibadah which you do which is obligatory upon you to, ha- to, to, to perform it correctly the amount of knowledge that you need to fulfill these things is wajib upon every Muslim and the Muslim therefore has to strive to become a student of knowledge to that degree, to that sense then if he wants to move beyond that and he wants to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with uh, seeking more knowledge and become one of the preservers of the sharia those who preserve the religion and who pass it on right then that, that is a great act of worship one of the greatest acts of worship that a person can do so seeking the means or seeking any means to uh, to gain knowledge is all within what is within uh, first it has to be something which is legitimate a correct way and it has to be something or and it's something which fulfills what you need to do as a person yeah what you need to do as a person so the the means and ways to seeking knowledge are first and foremost that knowledge is taken from its people knowledge is taken from its people yeah the people who have knowledge they are the ones who can give the knowledge and they can teach it and explain it correctly and a person should strive as much as he can and as much as he is able to take knowledge from his people in there are other means to to knowledge whereby a person supplements and adds to and increases uh, his knowledge and the more that he knows the more that he studies the more that he realizes the more he can utilize those means like reading books and you know listening to lectures that are recorded even if you can't study with scholars directly if you don't have the ability you don't have the a person works his way up and he tries to increase his knowledge so the person who wants to seek knowledge he has to first and foremost be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has to sincerely seek that knowledge to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise ignorance from himself and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly like Imam Malik I think it was believe it was Imam Malik he said uh, you know that he mentioned that he he didn't seek knowledge initially you know except for himself you know. he sought knowledge to make himself a, a better Muslim a better <coughs> worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the, the the thing so anyone who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the tawfiq can be a student of knowledge but we have to be clear as to what we mean by the student of knowledge you know we have to make this clear under, uh, we have to have this clear understanding between the fact that you know some people think that this what we're talking about is something extra that uh, you know uh, uh, people can choose to do as a as a kind of extra nafil deed something mustahab and they confuse or they they forget sometimes that there's a type of knowledge which is wajib it's obligatory upon everyone and nobody has an excuse a reason not to seek it right and then there, then we have another kind of understanding where sometimes we find some people thinking that everyone has to be like a, a student of knowledge full time like on his way to becoming a mufti and a scholar and this all also is not correct this is not wajib upon everyone and neither is it something that is possible right because people are different in their understanding in their levels of understanding in their abilities in their aql in their you know they they they're different of different degrees so neither is it obligatory upon everyone to be a student of knowledge in the time in the sense of learning the details of the sharia and going beyond what is individually an obligation upon us and neither is it possible that everyone will be a student of knowledge because people are of different kinds likewise there are certain characteristics this you know that need to be fulfilled by a person who seeks knowledge the first of them being that he must be sincere we'll go into those in more detail but he must have ikhlas because it's it's a it's an act of worship it's it's a type of ibadah and it's something that we have to do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please Allah and to benefit from our knowledge so that we can worship Allah better not for showing off not for arguing and winning arguments not for status not for a job not for anything but it should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so the sincere 
can be students of knowledge if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables them. Likewise, a person needs to have characteristics. He needs to have certain akhlaq, like patience. He needs to have patience because knowledge is a vast sea and there are difficulties, there are efforts that need to be put in to understand something correctly, to seek out knowledge in places and in uh, and to seek also the correct understanding of that knowledge. It takes a lot of uh, time and effort and so a person needs to be patient right so if you're not a patient person then you can't really be a student of knowledge in that in the true sense of the word right and likewise a person has to be and this is a, a attached or linked to a person's sincerity a person has to be someone who doesn't he's not um overly interested in just the world you know the worldly things the comforts of this life and amassing material gain you know and just be someone who's materialistic you know because a person who's materialistic is going to be corrupted by his knowledge he'll be corrupted by his knowledge and he may use that knowledge in the wrong way like selling his religion for some worldly gain yeah so uh, a person has to be someone who seeks knowledge for the correct reason that's why the early muslims some of the salaf they used to you know uh, lament the fact that every kind of person, you know, from the rabble of society have ended up trying to seek knowledge. You know? They used to say that this knowledge used to be amongst the noble people. You know, this, no, this knowledge used to be amongst the noble people. Then when every rabble started entering into it, then we had problems. This is where fitan and problems come in. Someone wants to you know, get a good job or earn some money or gain followers. So he seeks a bit of knowledge and he uses that knowledge to get followers, you know. Yeah, so a person has to be sharif, you know, they used to say. A person who wants to be, who wants to seek knowledge, he has to be sharif. He has to be a person who's noble in his character, in his behavior, in his intention, in what he wants to do, right? So, <laughs> you know, the the answer is, I suppose, that it's not true that every person can be a student of knowledge. Those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives tawfiq to. And they and they, they follow the, the right means. And we, we need to understand, maybe this is what you were asking about. Is that when you everything that you do to increase your knowledge can help you. The things that are legitimate and correct means like reading books and listening to talks and stuff. But a person always must remember what his place is and where his understanding has reached in knowledge, right? So that a person uh, can, uh, uh, he must first and foremost seek correct knowledge and correct understanding from the people of knowledge, right? And any other efforts he makes, reading and, and listening to tapes, listening to talks, he should always go back to the people of knowledge to try to get the correct understanding. If anything is difficult for him to understand, if anything is incomplete in his knowledge, then he should try to seek a correct understanding from it and not be, not suffice by being separate and being uh, independent in seeking knowledge. Okay, This is one area which becomes uh, difficult and it becomes a danger when a person becomes so independent that he thinks that by himself he can he can learn all knowledge right because if you sit down with a, a lot of books of hadith and loads of books you are going to make mistakes you will make mistakes in your understanding of knowledge we don't advocate you know this kind of uh, you know whatever this way of studying where a person is on his own and he doesn't go back to the people of knowledge yeah, that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, "Yahmilu hadha al-ilm min kulli khalafin udulu." That this knowledge is carried through every generation by the trustworthy, upright, reliable scholars. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say by books. Okay, the people are the ones who pass on the knowledge, right? And that's why it is said. There's a saying, "La ta'khud al-Quran." Don't take the Qur'an, don't learn the Qur'an from someone who just read from the Mus'haf and he didn't have a teacher to teach him how to read. And don't take knowledge from a Suhafi, one who just reads from books. Yeah. So a person should know the level. I mean, this is a general rule. It doesn't mean that there are people who don't benefit 
there are some people who are geniuses there are some people who have amazing abilities from Allah because this is from Allah and they can amass a great amount of knowledge in very difficult circumstances or in very short amount of time but the but the point is that everyone should know his level where he has reached in knowledge and should know that there are more pe- there are people that he should uh you know uh consult and ask and and try to benefit from Allah 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 you know, I've done an alim course yeah, yeah. for four years. I'm alim. Yeah. yeah. The question is like mm. this title. So yeah, you know, you understand. But yeah. you said the different degrees of mm-hmm. of student knowledge, wajib and detail. Yeah. Like, what about the title? Then? Yeah, the title. I mean, these things are something that are from the uh, you know the the strange and wonderful things that have happened in later times. You know, giving these kind of titles and uh, that someone is an alim just because you know uh, he has a certificate that says he's an alim or or this concept of being a student of knowledge talibul ilm you know it's become also overused and 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 you know brandished and thrown around we know the general rule it's a logical it's a truism and it's and it's true in islam as well as in any aspect of life is that the na- changing a name or giving something a name doesn't change its reality. Yeah, right. The al asma la tughayr al haqaiq. Names don't change the reality. If I say that this is a can of coke, it doesn't make it a can of coke. If I give it a certificate and say this is a can of coke, it doesn't give it a can- it doesn't make it a can of coke. So the re- the the being an alim, these are qualities. Being an alim, a scholar is a quality of a person. It's part of his character, it's part of his behavior. It's to do with what he knows. Alim means what someone knows. It doesn't mean what a name he has on a on a certificate. So there are plenty of people who have certificates in one field or another, and you will see he's a jahil. He's an ignorant person. Or you will see that he's not upright, and he's evil, or he's corrupt. Right? So an alim is a person who has knowledge. Beneficial knowledge, and from him you see that he practices that knowledge and that he puts it into practice, and he and he has it. So, you know, when when a question is asked that, how do we know ulama? We'll come on to that later. But an, an alim is known by his ilm. It sounds very obvious. Yeah, it sounds very obvious that an alim is known by his ilm, by his knowledge, not by what other people from people who don't know or some certificate or some thing. You know. Likewise, the talibul ilm, a student of knowledge. He's a student of knowledge because of his talab, because of his seeking that knowledge. Not because someone called him a talibul ilm. Yeah? And this is why you find the scholars who know, and, and we'll come on to later to see who the real ulama are. You know, the, they, the, 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 the pious predecessors, the early Muslims, when they would say, do you know who a real scholar is? Do you know who a real faqih is? Like Hassan al Basri and others said, Who's the real faqih? Who's the real faqih? Is the one who fears, fears Allah. The faqih, the real faqih, is the one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his knowledge is something that he benefits by and that he practices, puts it into practice, and he really puts the knowledge in its correct place. So, yeah, these titles and, and uh, names that people want to give to, to each other. If the person isn't really a student of knowledge and he's not really a scholar, then it doesn't matter how many people call him that. It doesn't matter what kind of certificate he has. Yes, it's true that a person can have names and labels, and he truly could be a scholar. You know. So if you look at scholars, the scholars that are known, you know, you will hear them often. You know, uh, scholars that are known to be scholars, they know they they are known to have dedicated their lives to knowledge. And dedicated their time to preserving and to passing on and teaching Islam. When they are asked or when they are when they are described or praised, you know, they often say, "You will hear it." You, they will often say, "Look, I'm I'm just a student of knowledge. I'm just a new. I'm just a student." You have big people, imams in fatwa. They say this. Al Fawzan, Hafizahullah, one of the great scholars of this time, who is with us. You, you will hear him. He says, "I'm just a student of knowledge." 
I'm just a student. Al Albani, Al Albani, rahimahullah, would say, "I'm a toilib. I'm a small student of knowledge." Because these titles and these names, it's the reality that really matters. And when a person has knowledge, it, he becomes humble. When he has real knowledge, he becomes humble. He knows how much that responsibility, that knowledge is, and what it means in his life that he now has to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, it makes a person realize how much he doesn't know. And that's one of the qualities of beneficial knowledge we'll go on to discuss, is that knowledge, the more you increase in knowledge, the more you realize how much you don't know and how, uh, uh, how much you are in need of more knowledge and in need of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it makes you humble. Knowledge, if you see a person who's supposed to be a scholar, who's supposed to be a student of knowledge, and he acts arrogantly, then you know that he doesn't, he's not really a person who's benefited from that knowledge. Even if he has, technically he has some kind of information at his fingertips. Likewise, a person who uses knowledge in a corrupt way. A person who uses his knowledge in a corrupt way, then he's not a scholar in the sense of a person who's going to benefit from that knowledge and the person that we can benefit from. Okay? Because there's something which is, there are people who are corrupt. Corrupt scholars. Corrupt students. Okay, because they use it in order to attain some worldly gain or to or into misrepresent Islam or to make something which is haram halal. Yeah, we have people who are like this. Okay, so yeah, that, that's a vast topic. It, it all comes into understanding the the thing. But the, but the, in the end, what it is is that the rea- you know names and labels don't change the reality of anything. Another quick question. Sorry. Enough. You should be answering you know, these questions. Group of people, yeah? You know, because you mentioned here that uh, Ibn Rajiv Rahimullah said that treading the path, mm. right, <coughs> was walking or moving to seek knowledge. Mm. So, what about these people? There's a group of people that go out for 40 days. Mm. Yeah, they gather the people and they go out for 40 days and stuff mm. like that. Is this the same as going out for seeking knowledge? What yeah, so, so we have groups of people or a group of people who who have institutionalized this kind of going out to give da'wah or to what they call, you know, in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they say that you go out for 40 days or a certain specific amount of time you spend this time going out and this, uh, by doing this you are, you know, doing a great deed and you're helping to spread Islam so does this equate to or is this an example of seeking, uh, treading a path to seek knowledge then with the sp- specifically with regards to this type of action or this type of uh, institutionalized what they call khuruj going out in the path of Allah then I, uh, I quite clearly and without any apologies we say no this is not what it means to go out and seek knowledge and the biggest I suppose the clearest and biggest reason for this is that those people who do this who have this this jama'ah this group that does this, they are against knowledge in the first place. They are against knowledge in the first place. So, they have a principle, they have a principle that they say, in these 40 days, in this in this time that we go out, in, in our activities, we want to talk about fada'il, not masail. We want to talk about fadail or fazail and not masail. What what do they mean by that? If you say in this time or to these people, look, this is wrong. In Islam, this is wrong. This practice is shirk, is 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 worship of other than Allah. This practice is bid'ah. If you try to give advice and you try to practice the sunnah of giving advice to Muslims and this is a, this is a, in the first place what they're supposed to be going out for doing you will be reprimanded you will be reprimanded and you will be told don't cause problem amongst people and our way is fazail not masail meaning that we want to call people to the masjid we want them to do good things and remind them of the, the, the reward of praying for example the reward of praying in jama'ah the reward of reading Quran but as soon as you start telling someone this is right and this is wrong no we don't do this why? because people will 
be uh, put off from this people will be put off by this so when you do try when you have knowledge or when you try to uh, employ knowledge of right and wrong yes in Islam for them this is counterproductive this is counterproductive to da'wah so these people are essentially whether they know it or not they are against knowledge they are against knowledge the other thing is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't didn't uh, institutionalize or didn't set down for us that everyone and anyone who wants to go out to give da'wah should go he didn't do this this in itself is a bid'ah this in itself is an innovation in religion and in fact it's one of the most dangerous kinds of innovation why because it means that the person who doesn't have knowledge is going to enter into knowledge and da'wah okay and this is a very dangerous thing the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam didn't say for us to go out and to give da'wah outside for a certain amount of time for a specified amount of time or an unspecified amount of time if we don't have the knowledge and we don't have the ability to do so and we don't even have the uh, the will to spread correct knowledge you see so this way of trying to just invite people uh, and get them together and make them feel good just by going out for a certain amount of time and they travel from one country to another and they leave their families and they do all kinds this way if if the people involved are devoid of knowledge and they're devoid of following the sunnah then they sp- they're going to spread more harm than good yeah and it's it's forbidden for us to speak about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without knowledge and this group wants us to speak without knowledge so a person who comes to the masjid, a person who has been Muslim two days, a person who comes after having spent a lot of time disobeying Allah, not knowing anything about the religion, he, he alhamdulillah, he, he becomes persuaded that he wants to come to the masjid. In two, three days, he's a da'i. He goes out and gives da'wah. What, what do you think will be the result of this? Is this the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is so cheap that we just speak about it just from our own uh, you know our own opinion without knowing without verifying what is correct knowledge what is not and it's haram it's forbidden it's one of the biggest sins in fact the biggest sin is to speak about Allah without knowledge that's the biggest sin is to speak about Allah without knowledge so in the institutionalizing 40 days or whatever number of days a specific number of days there's a bid'ah is an innovation because the Prophet ﷺ didn't do this and he didn't attach any reward or any specific kind of uh, distinction to a certain number of days. That's, that's the least or that's the smallest of the problems with this. In, in, and in, in of itself, it's big. Some people, t- the, some of them, they try to say that, look, you know, it's, it's only for organizational purposes that we say 40 days. No. If you look at these people, they attach a significance to 40 days why not 39 days or 35 days and we know that one of the principles of knowing what is a sunnah from a bid'ah is that a, 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 if, a, if a particular kind of uh, attribute or description is given to an ibadah right which is not present in the sunnah which is not present in the Quran and sunnah it makes it a, an innovation it makes it a bid'ah and for something to be according to the sunnah, it has to be according to the sunnah in a number of ways. It has to be according to the sunnah in when you do it, why you do it, yeah, how you do it, the number of times you do it, the time that you do it in. yeah. So for example, if I said that uh, you know, it's good for us, it's, there's a fadila, there's, a, there's a, a virtue in us... Um, you know, uh, fasting on a Tuesday, right? At such and such time, yeah? If you fast, this this is very good. And I'm going to call everyone to do this together. Is this acceptable or not? It's not acceptable because what I've done is now I've, I've, I'm copying or I'm trying to resemble the Sharia. I'm trying to resemble Islam in making certain qualities and 
and distinguishing features of an ibadah. Even though fasting, you can fast on a Tuesday if you fast, you fast. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's rewardable. But since I add to it a particular quality or a particular restriction or a particular virtue, this makes it a bid'ah. And this in Islam, in al-fiqh is called al-bid'ah al-idhafiyya. It's called a bid'ah, al-bid'ah al-idhafiyya. The bid'ah which is the type where the, the, the original act has some basis, like praying and fasting and so on. But you modify it in a way that takes it outside of what is in the sunnah. Yeah? So that, and that is the least of the problems of the f- go, going out for 40 days. The, essentially, you will notice that these people don't go out to spread knowledge. They go out to spread their own particular ideas. And they are actually, they uh, go against knowledge. And this is something you don't have to, you know, you can, this is something you can test, you can see. Right? This jama'ah who goes out and does this, they, are, they actually go out against knowledge. Because they say you are splitting people away by telling them this is halal, this is haram, this is sunnah, this is bid'ah. No, don't tell people this. Just tell them to come to the masjid. Fazail, not masail. That's the principle of this. It's one of their sha'ah. That we have fazail, not masail. So, what is Islam? What is ilm? What is knowledge? Knowledge is masail. It's the issues of the religion. What is, what is correct? What is right? What is wrong? Yeah? And the angels, when they described the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what did they describe describe him as? When they came to him, what did they describe the malaika of Allah? They described the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Muhammadun farqun bain al nas. Muhammad splits people. He separates people. Why? How does he separate people? The kafir from the Muslim. The righteous from the people who are sinful. That the whole concept of being a Muslim and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you are doing what, trying to do what is right and staying away from what is wrong. So if we blur this and we kind of try to put this aside, what ilm, what knowledge is there left? What is there left? What's, what's the point of da'wah? What's the point of any da'wah? Then? So, yeah, so, you know, for more than one reason, this is a wrong practice. Anakal <laughs> nafuk.